Diablo was the youngest of the prime evils, but I found him the most dangerous, for his power over terror left him incapable of feeling fear. To many, Diablo is simply a villain, having lost just as many battles for the Burning Hells in the Eternal Conflict, including losing to the High Heavens outside of their gates, victory at hand due to bickering with Bale and Mephisto, his brothers, over the spoils of war pre-victory, and suffering devastating defeat after defeat on Sanctuary to mere human heroes throughout the Diablo series. But. In reality, Diablo is a complete and utter genius, a ruthless, cunning, and brilliant tactician shown to be incredibly long-sighted and able to insidiously adapt his nefarious schemes over time, where angels have been hopelessly outmatched by his machinations, as seen by his Ark vs Imperius, even becoming the penultimate embodiment of Tathomet in Diablo 3, where no other demon or angel alike has come close to that kind of unmitigated power. Furthermore, an argument could be not only made that Diablo will be the ultimate reason the Burning Hells will be victorious in the eternal conflict, as foreseen by Ithereal, the Angel of Fate, but that he will probably be more powerful than ever in Diablo 4. To see if you share the same conclusion, first we must delve into Diablo's own storied history and past that showcases his immutable efforts to adapt, overcome, and eventually dominate and terrorize all that oppose him. Since the first spark of creation, angels have waged the eternal conflict to defeat the forces of darkness and corruption. First, during the eternal conflict, the heavenly host and demonic legions forever gaining and acceding ground in this non-stop ebb and flow, Diablo astutely discerned a hole in their armor, imperious, his weakness of his wrathful nature. Perhaps you fear them seeing you for what you truly are. I fear nothing! Goading him into killing him, an enraged Imperius declared that demonkind could only be dealt with through blood, showing his hand to the rest of the council and slaying the Lord of Terror against their will. Take your vengeance, Imperius. Seal your victory. This is not justice, brother. In his last words, Diablo mocked the Injurious Council for its supposed unity and would later capitalize on the dissonance he created in the Council. So much for your unity. The trap at last is sprung. The next events neither side saw coming. The eternal conflict came to a halt with the disappearance of the Worldstone. The rogue angel Inarius and demon Lilith created Sanctuary and Mankind, changing the playing field drastically with the birth of their new progeny, the Nephilim, fabled to be more powerful than angel and demon alike. As such, Diablo quickly realized where angels or even his brothers initially would not that the best course of action to win the war would be to leverage this new power through the Nephilim and would use the Triune. Through subtlety and subterfuge influencing them to his schemes, it was only when the Nephilim Uldisium had become too much of a threat that Diablo, in an unprecedented move and being incredibly resourceful, was not above enlisting the aid of Inarius himself to gain the upper hand. Although Eldisian had forced both Heaven and Hell's presence from Sanctuary, this in turn only spurred Diablo on further to put his grand scheme to control the Nephilim to win the war ultimately in motion. First was to call a treaty between Heaven and Hell and get out of Sanctuary, as he knew the bait would gladly be taken by the angels, who representing Stasis were mostly content with continuing the stalemate in the war. Diablo, however, was not. Although Diablo and his brothers kept subtly influencing Sanctuary after the treaty, he and his brothers had kept Sanctuary's existence a secret from the lesser evils, and that had driven a wedge between them. They rose up in a rebellion, Diablo and his brothers were banished into Sanctuary in what became known as the Dark Exile. 
Although it looks like they are the victims in this scenario, in truth, this was a plan of the primeval's part to corrupt the world stone and, in turn, humanity to their side. While Diablo and his brothers were free to wreak havoc for a few decades, their presence came to be discovered by the Archangel Tyriel, who formed the Herodrum to find and capture the three brothers. Although, in time, Diablo was defeated and imprisoned within a soul stone by the Herodrum, this set in motion his tactical brilliant plan to corrupt the world stone the very source of Sanctuary's power, and tipped the tide of war. Step 1. He corrupted the Archbishop Lazarus in the town of Tristram so he could find a new host. Step 2. He then attempted to corrupt King Leoric as the perfect vessel. However, Leoric resisted his temptation. So Diablo made an immense power move. He instead focused on Leoric's son, Ulbricht. Although this seems superficially like a bad move, why take over a 10-year-old kid's body when you can have a king? It not only gave him a host body, but drove Leoric mad. In turn, Leoric slaughtered his own townspeople wholesale. Step 3. Leoric's guards tried to intervene, killing Leoric, who cursed them with his dying breath. Traitors! Even in death, the armies of Condorus will still obey their king, even if you will not. So now Diablo has a new body while he regains power, and the very king and his guards curse to protect him while he terrorizes their townsfolk. But Diablo didn't count on Leoric's son, Aiden, a warrior showing up. Diablo then admittedly is defeated by Aiden, and it seems like he would be stuck in his purgatory waiting to reform. Then, somewhat foolishly, Aiden attempts to contain Diablo's essence within himself. My companion, the Wanderer, Dalrasha, and a great evil who could only be the lord of hatred himself, Mephisto. Giving him a new, stronger host body to go east, free his other brothers who were captive by Herodrum, and exact their plan by corrupting the world stone, and then utilizing Sanctuary to get the upper hand in the battle. But not before he makes two stops. The first is to see Adria, the town witch, to conceive a baby with her for a much later host body to become the primeval. Even before he was setting out to free his brothers and corrupt the world stone, he'd learned of the black soul stone and wanted to capture them into himself and become the strongest evil that had ever been known, the prime evil, which is the embodiment of all of the evils rolled up into one. The second, perhaps more low-key move was to collect a drifter named Marius. Whether Diablo's insight was so keen to know he would later play a vital role in aiding the prime evils taking over the world stone is unknown, but he ended in being the linchpin that did so. Although Diablo was defeated by the Nephilim, his plan did come to fruition. The world stone was corrupted, and although they nearly won, Tyriel, in an unprecedented move, destroyed the stone. But it didn't seem to phase Diablo in the slightest, as he'd seemed to always counted on this contingency. It's easy to see why Diablo would be looking to gain more power. First, he's defeated when he tries to take over Albrecht. Then he becomes stronger after he takes over the warrior Aiden's body, after which he is defeated by the Nephilim. So in turn, he comes back as the strongest being that he can, learning from each mistake, the living embodiment of Tathamim, the prime evil. You cannot hide from me, no matter what form you choose to wear. Let your true self be revealed. Diablo. Which went toe to toe with Anu himself. Basically, if the heavens and hell could be summed up as one thing, it would be heavens would be Anu, the evils would be Tathamit. So he became literally the embodiment of the darkness, something Imperius could never dream of happening, as he crumples him like a used tissue when he shows up to the door, save for the interference of the Nephilim. Now, you cannot fault Diablo for not knowing even the powers of all seven of the original evils wouldn't be enough to stop the Nephilim. Instead, applaud his tenacity to come back each time adapting and becoming more dangerous to literally the most powerful being that hell had ever seen. 
I think this proves without a shadow of a doubt that Diablo is the most diabolical, genius, and dangerous enemy in the titular series and the Burning Hells have seen, save for the Nephilim. Now, it could be argued that the writing in Diablo 3 put his character in somewhat of a corner. The Black Soul Stone setting up with Adria a little prematurely didn't make as much sense pre-Diablo 2, and asking the pertinent question, how do you go up from a prime evil, or do the Nephilim forcibly go down? As their god tier power to smash through even the prime evil, and then the prime evil plus an angel Malthiel, leaves not so much room to create plausible threats in future series. Or will Diablo find a way to merge with angels or Nephilim alike in Diablo 4? One thing's for sure, only time will tell, and if you agree or disagree with this conclusion about Diablo, let me know in the comments below. I love to share in theories and speculation and appreciate the support this series has gotten thus far. Let me know who you'd like me to cover in the next character analysis, and until then, see you next time. Travel.